Life Over Coffee, Conversations for Transformation. Hello, my friends. Welcome. My name is Rick Thomas at lifeovercoffee.com. You can find us at our street address, lifeovercoffee.com. That's our coffee shop, our sanctification center, where we have tons of resources for you on all things pertaining to sanctification. I am in the middle of my book, Help My Marriage Has Grown Cold. This is a nine-chapter book, and you can get a free download a digital download at lifeovercoffee.com. Go to our store, look for that title, Help My Marriage Has Grown Cold. You can download it, you can print it off, use it as a course study, a Sunday school lesson. Use it if you're counseling someone, whether it's dating, courting, pre-marriage, marriage. If you just want to do a case study, for those of you who do the work of discipleship, biblical counseling, this would be an excellent long form case study that you can read, you can watch, and listen. This is chapter 3. The title of it is The Snare of Perceived Needs. We're helping Mabel as she realized that she made an immature decision to get married. Her husband is addicted to porn as she found out five years later. She has come for counseling and that is what we are doing. In the last chapter, I talked about her need to build this theological or to reconstruct this theological foundation that she had. I made a case for building it and don't succumbing to the temptation of doing pragmatic counseling because counselees uh, will want to work on the problems. Just give me some communication tips. Give me some best practices. And they don't want to do the discovery work of what's going on underneath. They don't want to do the deconstruction and the construction of the things that actually got them to the place to where they are. In one sense, we can be very pragmatic where we're doing more behavioral modification than the deeper work where all of our problems find their genesis. Of course, we want to slow roll this thing. We don't want to move too fast because if a person doesn't have an understanding of biblical counseling, not only can the counselor speed things up, but the counselee can put pressure on you to speed things up when you know that you haven't built a significant foundation. And so in this chapter, I'm still doing that underground work, and I want to get into Mabel's theology of needs. She has a need deficit theory, and it is askew, and so we need to unpack it as we say And again, that's what this chapter is about. Chapter 3, The Snare of Perceived Needs. Now, the most significant trap that tripped up Mabel was that her desire for marriage, and that is the operative word uh, that I want to pin to the wall during this discussion, her desire for marriage and companionship had morphed into something that God had never intended. And this is something that we really have to be clued into especially if the desire that we have is good. Most of us have enough awareness to know that things that aren't good for us or things that are morally improper, we have enough sense to know that we need to uh, self-control those things. We need to put them at bay. But sometimes we can have good desires and we can be blinded to those desires because they are good. And if we're not careful, we can impregnate those desires until they start to morph into something to where the desire is good in a vacuum, the desire is good in itself, but now the desire has control of, over my heart. I'm no longer managing my desire and I can live with it or without it, but now my desire is driving the train, meaning it is operative in my soul and it is guiding me more than good common sense or the biblical narrative. And so Mabel, her desire for marriage and companionship has done exactly that. It has morphed into something that God never intended. She got herself caught up in the self-centered craving of perceived needs as popularized by our culture. 
Now, please understand, I'm using the word self-centered just between you and me. This is not the kind of language that you want to use in a counseling session, especially not on the front end. And even though my counseling sessions are two hours in length, I am still under construction. I am still building a relational bridge, and so our wordsmithing need to be cautioned with compassion. And though she is very much self-centered, we want to word it in an appropriate way. And so what you may read here in this book, Help, My Marriage Has Grown Cold, it is really more for the academy. It's more for the classroom where we talk more in the raw. But there is a bedside manner. There is a way of being pastoral to people. And so we want to be guarded, though I'm speaking in the raw, in the academy, we want to be very compassionate with how we communicate in the counseling session. But nevertheless, she has got herself caught up in self-centered craving. And this has been popularized, not just in our culture, but also within the Christian culture. As I talked about in the last chapter, number two, getting into her theology specifically as it circled around Romans 8.28, she saw the good that God offered her through the lens of contemporary Christian literature rather than through the lens of God's Word. Things like love languages and love and respect and his needs and her needs. These are some of the books and buzzwords that are bandied about Christendom to find wholeness and to resolve relational conflict and to live your best life now. I do understand why such materials exist in marriage counseling specifically. But these concepts are generally more of a hindrance than they are of, a, of help. And one of the problems with these concepts, there are several, but one of them, on the surface, they sound good. Shouldn't we love one another? Shouldn't we respect one another? Shouldn't we think about a person's needs? Shouldn't we speak in a way that is helpful to them, in a way that they can understand? Those are common, common sense questions that all end in the affirmative yes. But the problem is that these uh, books and these concepts become askewed, especially if our desire, if our presupposition has already morphed into something that is more of a need, then we're going to eisegetically read into these books and we're going to use them and even manipulate others to use them in a self-serving way. This cultural worldview had most assuredly hindered Mabel. If she had a proper understanding of God and his gospel, then her approach would have been much different. In fact, it would have looked more like Jesus' approach to life, which looked more like serving rather than seeking to be served. And that's what you will hear with a lot of the language that people use, love and respect, and uh, his needs, her needs, and love languages, what you will hear most of the time is that the person who is talking about this will be speaking from in a passive way that this is something that they are not doing to me. If he spoke my love language or if she respected me or if they were meeting my needs and that's typically how this is communicated and again that is absolutely backwards from what the point of the gospel is. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, we have this wonderful sentence that communicates Jesus' presupposition and his worldview. And of course, out of that flowed the life that he lived. He said, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And you also hear Paul saying in Philippians 2, let this mind of Christ be yours. Count others more significant than yourselves. Esteem others more than yourself. And that is the heart of the gospel. That is the heart of Christ. But rarely do counselees think this way. I mean, they will, yes, give a courtesy nod. Yes, they will tick that box. Yes, they will quote that scripture back to you. But practically on the ground and the way that they interact with others and the way or the things that they expect from others, it will be antithetical to the scripture that they just quoted most of the time. 
They do not see the necessity of restoring their relationship with God foundationally, which I talked about in chapter 2. And then what flows naturally out of that is a desire to serve others more than themselves. Again, as Paul said in Philippians 2 verses 3 and 4. This is a God-centered and other-centered perspective. This is the royal law. We are to love God and love others. The entire law, over 600 laws in the Old Testament, are summed up in those four words that are all unidirectional, moving from the subject to the object. God so loved the world. And therefore, we are to love God most of all and others secondarily. And with that unidirectional approach, we are fulfilling everything that God has taught us in the Old Testament. So with this God-centered, other-centered perspective, it was a massive hole in Mabel's thinking. And what was so skewed about this, or what was so hard to see, what was so ambiguous, is that she understands all of this. Because if you talk to her, she understands. And that's where you want to be very clear, patient and compassionate, but also very clear that there is an incongruency between what you say you believe. Your, your orthodoxy is not congruent with your orthopraxy. And you're not trying to be unkind, but she just can't go into Christianese. She just can't go into intellectualizing what she knows when it stands incongruent to how she actually lives. So Mabel seems not to understand that her sinful attitudes toward Biff and her desire for Biff to meet her needs had actually grieved God and had in part set the marriage up for failure. And be careful here. Remember, it was her that found out that Biff was in porn. It was her that was devastated by uh, his porn addiction. It was her who has been the recipient of his rage. And so there is a, a victimness there. And so you want to be careful. She is the offended one. But what you're going to find in almost, well, I would say every marriage does stuff, is that you're going to have the victim center construct. And you want to be careful how you communicate this. You do not want to marginalize or minimalize what has happened to her. You can't go there. You should not go there. You, you don't want to do that at all. But you also do not want to ignore the fact that you are contributing to this. You're not to blame for his pornography. Didn't say that at all. You're not to blame for his anger. Did not say that as well. James is very clear. What causes quarrels and what causes conflict among you? Is it not this? Biff, you desire and you do not have, and so you rage at Mabel. You covet and you do not obtain, so you murder her with your anger. No, the cause is not Mabel. Did not say that. The cause is Biff and his desires and the war that he has inside of him. But all of that does not dismiss the fact that Mabel has a contribution, a sinful contribution in the demise of this marriage. And if you have appropriately built that relational bridge with her, you will be able at the appropriate time to bring in the other half of the construct, not just the victimness of it, but also the center aspect too. The weight of the marriage the weight of the marriage failure, the weight of it, the majority of it was not entirely her fault. But she was the one who sought counseling at this time. She is the only one that I could counsel. She is the one that is humble enough to work through it. And you have to trust that her humility will set her up to receive the very thing that she is asking for, counsel. And I would assume that the counsel that she is asking for is how can she change? Oh yeah, she needs to help Biff and Biff has a lot to address. But you want to make sure that when a counselee is sitting before you in counseling, that the counseling is not uh, how the person not in the room should receive counseling and what is wrong with them. 
you'll have that a lot where people will come and state their case, but the case is about the other person who is not there. You can't do anything with that because they're not there. They're not asking. God apparently is not granting repentance, and so you have to work with what you have. And the primary part that you're going to work with is their role, their responsibility, their relationship with God, how they can change, and then as a tertiary matter, how they can help the person who's not interested in changing in this case, Bill. And so, because Mabel is here, I have to address what is going on in her heart and life, hoping that the humility that brought her to counseling will be the humility that will give her ears to hear what she needs to hear, and part of that will be her responsibility in the demise of the marriage. Mabel's main concern were that her husband had not met her needs or spoken her love language. That is how she communicated that to me, and of course she is borrowing that language from the dominant Christian culture because that's how our Christian culture communicates, unfortunately. She also had a list of ideas of how he could express her love language more practically to her. And then later, upon further exploration with Biff, this was in several counseling sessions in the future when he finally showed up, I learned that he was frustrated because his wife did not respect him. Do you see what's going on here? They have latched on to books in the culture. They have basically grabbed the titles and also how people generally communicate those titles. They have embraced them as a deficit in their own souls and they would be whole, they would be better, they would be more responsive to their spouses if their spouses did those things for them. Mabel says, if you would just communicate my love languages, and Biff would say, if you would just respect me, well, then we could have a great marriage. Do you see how the log and the speck is totally reversed? He had ideas of what his love for her could look like if only she would make the first move by meeting his needs, which began with love and respect. Notice how desires have now morphed to an entirely different word, which has an entirely different definition. A desire is one thing, but need is another. A desire you can have or not have, you're not managed by it, but a need, it is more definitive, it is clearer, it is black and white, and it is more controlling. And now they have taken some of the language and expectations from the culture, and they have put it inside. They have, have stuffed it inside this word need. And for Biff, it began with love and respect. Each spouse had been manipulating the other while neither grieved over how they had dishonored God. They could not see the trees for the forest. Their relationship was more about mutual need meeting than confessing their sin against God, to God and to each other. When our conversation with each other is more about what the other person is not doing, where rather than agreeing, confessing with God according to his word about what we're not doing, then our relationship is spiraling downhill and into dysfunction. If they chose to restore their broken relationship with God, they would be well on their way to restoring their relationship with each other. Any Christian spouse can get the love they desire. And this is something that you have to hear. I am not saying that uh, Biff should not love his wife, and I'm not saying that Mabel should not love or not respect her husband. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying the approach to accomplish those good aims, those good desires, the approach is wrong because they won't find it. They won't get it. They won't be able to obtain and secure it through self-centered, self serving methods. Manipulating love out of a person is not love. And skipping or marginalizing God to have a great marriage is like trying to have a wonderful meal without food. It is incoherent. When a spouse understands the gospel rightly, they will see how it is not about meeting needs, but pursuing each other in other-centered love. I'm going to assume that everybody listening to this, the podcast, watching the video, I'm just going to assume that you are a Christian for now. Some of you may not be. 
And that's fine in the sense that I'm glad that you're here and I'm glad that you're listening or watching. I would appeal to you to love God and love others with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that would begin by becoming a Christian, being born again. To be regenerated is what it means to be born again. Where God saves you from your sins, past, present, and future, and secures a spot in heaven. He gives you an alien righteousness because there is no good works that you can do. For by grace you are saved. We cannot earn heaven. We cannot earn any goodness whatsoever from our works. We earn goodness through the work that Christ did, not ours. God would save you if you wanted to be, if you happen to be here and you're not. But let's assume for a moment that everyone is. Well, you love Christ so much. Christians love Christ so much because why? He unselfishly came to this planet to rescue us from our sin. He saved us and now he is restoring us to himself. One day he will allow us to join him in heaven, to live an eternal existence with him. He accomplished this by taking on human flesh, living three decades on earth and then dying on a cross. God poured out his wrath on his son while he was hanging on that cross. Christ hung there in our place. He took our wrath. He took our punishment. Christ paid the price that we owed. This worldview is the gospel. It is unfathomable, stunning love. This kindness bends our heart toward Christ in repentance. It motivates us to want to change. How nice it would be if we could dismiss the Christian mutual need meeting ideas and seek and seek practically to be kind to one another the way Christ has been kind to us, as motivated by and understood through what I just shared with you, a, a short analysis of the gospel. Paul talked about this unimaginable love when he said in Romans 2, 4, do you take for granted the riches of his kindness, the riches of his forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to change? If you want Biff to change, then, well, this little analysis of the gospel gives us a way of framing what change looks like. It's not by demanding that you meet my need, that you speak my love language, that you love and respect me. Rather than figuring out our love languages, we can die to ourselves and aggressively love each other the way Christ has aggressively loved us as I have outlined. In God's economy, we receive by giving, not focusing on what others do for us. This perspective is what Paul was saying in Ephesians 5, verse 27, quote, So that he, Christ, might present the church to himself, that Christ may present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Christ will receive what he paid for. Christ will receive what he worked for, a church in all her splendor. I said earlier that it's not wrong to want someone to love you. It's not wrong necessarily for someone to respect you, but how we go about it can be wrong. Christ will present to himself a church in and, and all her splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without a blemish. How is he going to receive so much love and affection from the church? Because he paid for it. He worked for it. A husband who chooses to die to his desires and seeks to serve his wife will receive a special kind of lady. A wife who decides to do the same for her husband will be well on her way to enjoying a much better marriage. As I have pondered this need question about genuine needs, 
I have come up with what I believe is an exhaustive list of needs. I put them in two categories, physical needs, things that we absolutely have to have, and then spiritual needs, things that we absolutely have to have. Here's my list. I think this is exhaustive. Can you add to it? Air, we need it. Water, have to have it. Shelter, now that depends. If you live, I started to say on a deserted island, you may need shelter, so I'm putting it in here. Food, we need it. Health, we need it. Those are true needs in the physical realm. In the spiritual realm, we have needs. We need God's salvation. He has to act upon us. We need His salvation. We also need the ongoing spirit empowerment. What have we received that was not given to us? We need God's, spiritually speaking, we need His intervention in our life. In counseling, however, it's a different story. I have heard person after person give me a laundry list of all their needs. Let me give you a few of the front runners. I need love. I need sex. I need communication. I need companionship, significance, acceptance. I need respect. Many Christians confuse the necessity of needs with desires. There is nothing that I shared in that laundry list of front runners that is necessarily wrong. But these Christians do not realize how their desire, their craving for these things in their extended need list, that it actually controls them. Often I will illustrate the difference between a need and a desire this way. For example, if you held me underwater in a swimming pool for an extended period, I would fight you to the end because I need air. A need is something you cannot live without. But when you elevate desires, good desires, typically is what we're talking about because this is what confuses us the most. And when you elevate a good desire to the level of need, there is a form of idolatry happening. And if you do not repent of the idolatry, that craving for that desire morphed into a need will wreck the relationship from which you are trying to extract that perceived need. This is chapter 3, The Snare of Perceived Needs. It is part of a larger work, an e-book. Uh, on our website that is free to you. It's called, Help, My Marriage Has Grown Cold. Marriage, uh, Mabel has realized that her, her marriage is not what she had thought. In chapter 2, we started unearthing her theology, and now out of that theological construct, we are getting into uh, how her bad theology has uh, influenced or altered how she thinks about what Biff should be doing for her as far as desires are concerned, and now she is in a snare of needs. Those desires, by the way, that has morphed into needs predated her relationship with Biff. It was actually those desires that created the presuppositional filter uh, that skewed how she saw Biff and what she wanted from him and which sped them up to the altar and now, in God's mercy to her, he is, because she loves God with all her heart, soul, mind, and strength, God is doing her a solid here by bringing her to a place of just destruction so that she can get her theology right, she can get her application of theology right, and as we will see in future uh, chapters here, that it will begin to impact her marriage above ground, practically speaking. Again, this is chapter 3, The Snare of Perceived Needs. Here's a few questions for you. And again, I put these call to actions at the end of each chapter because that's how I write every book. Uh, this book here on marriage, which I highly recommend, Get Ready. Great book for dating, courting, marriage. Those who have already tied the knot, it's an excellent book. But with all of my books, all of my writings, I have CTAs at the end because we want to make it practical. We want to really practicalize it into our lives. And so here's a few questions for you. Number one, what would you add to your list of physical or spiritual needs? You remember the list that I gave you earlier about food and shelter and health and water and air and God's spiritual intervention in our lives? Would you add anything to it? Why? And then... Can you live without them? 
Or you say my list is not exhaustive? Okay, that's fine. Then make your case. Maybe, let me ask it this way. If you were on a deserted island, would you need everything on your list? Or are there a few things that are desires? Number three, how would a person behave if they made a non-need a need? And the person they expected the non-need from, uh, what would they, how would they react to them if they did not supply it? Now, maybe you can use yourself as an illustration here. I know I definitely can use myself as an illustration here, but we won't do that because we're at the end. Uh, but spend some time thinking about how you have elevated a desire, morphed into a need, and then you place that need expectation on them, and then you, you can go into manipulation mode. And, of course, you set yourself up for failure. Every time we do that, we set ourselves up for failure. And then, of course, that person is going to respond adversely. And so now we have a double sin happening. The first one where we initiated by manipulating them or gaslighting them or expecting them to do something that we have elevated uh, from desire to need, then they do not respond correctly, and now it's two sinners sinning against each other. Number four, have you ever elevated a desire to a need and sinned against someone for not meeting your particular need? If you have, by the way, if that is still hanging out there, then my best advice to you would be to resolve it today, that you go to that person based on what you have heard here in this chapter and say, hey, man, uh, I like that thing. I, I desire that thing. Uh, but I think I have pumped too much inside of that thing and now is way bigger than it should be. Chapter 3, The Snare of Perceived Needs from the larger book. Help, my marriage has grown cold. Go over to our store and get a free download of that book. It is yours. Use it personally, but also as you help others to work through some of our common issues. Thank you so much. And God bless. Thanks for joining us. Learn more and get access to other resources at lifeovercoffee.com.